Ed and he's gonna tell us in a way that only a Marine can describe the battle of uh, Musgrove's Mill. You're gonna take a break for the food? No, we'll just keep going. <laughs> Can everybody see that okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll try not to uh, let my Jersey City accent uh, get the better, the better of me. But I tell people well, I'm from South Jersey. To be honest, my interest in the Battle of Musgrove's Mill stemmed from being a member, or having the privilege of being a member, of a two-year mapping research project entitled Campaign 1776. Provided with a grant from the American Battlefield Preservation Trust and also the National Park Service, and in conjunction with the South Carolina Battlefield Preservation Trust, we were tasked to research and map 20 pre-selected Revolutionary War battlefields in the Carolinas, both North and South two of which I was tasked to take the lead on. And to be perfectly honest with you, you were right yesterday, Charles, two that I had never heard before. Musgrove's Mill and the Siege of Fort Watson. So the learning curve was pretty steep. The group contained some of the shakers and movers in the southern campaigns of the American Revolution SCAR study group. Many of them you know very well. Charles Baxley, David Bostick, David Brewer, Brett Bennett, Dr. Leon Harris, Bill Anderson, Eric Nason, Mike Yiannopoulos, and last but certainly not least, John Allison, who thanks to his detective and archaeological work, actually discovered the Patriot Battle Line, the key terrain feature on the battlefield of Musgrove's Mill. Now, all work resulted in the production of a footnoted battle narrative and accompanying phase battle maps. Additionally, it also included a bibliography, a chronology of events, an evaluation of the surrounding terrain using the military acronym COCAR, a recommendation for any additional archeological work felt to be necessary, and lastly, the possible purchase of any adjacent property to the site in an effort to preserve, protect, and develop them for future generations of Americans. Our main task, however, was to develop the phase battle maps. Our intent in this regard was to create a phase, standalone, visual portrayal of the events associated with the campaign and the battles as they evolved. Okay, mount up, move out. Boy, I'm just saying that. <laughs> well, here we go. In order to appreciate the significance of the Battle of Musgrove's Mill, I think it's first important to appreciate and understand both the strategic and operational situation as it existed during the summer of 1780, as depicted here as a refresher. British stalemate in the North and Middle States results in the adoption of a new strategy to regain the initiative and recover what they believe to be 
the vulnerable yet economically valuable South, which was the most profitable of all the British mainland colonies. Hopefully by inciting a popular uprising in an effort to Americanize the war. Soon, France, Spain, and the Dutch will eventually enter the war. The struggle then becomes a war on a global scale, vice a localized colonial insurgency. Unfortunately, not worth a continental becomes a common phrase. The economy is suffering from rampant inflation, mainly because Congress primarily lacked the power to levy taxes to meet the national needs. Not that they have that problem today. Our young country was suffering from an enfeebled government. Under the Articles of Confederation, what I refer to in the classroom as the Articles of Confusion, passed eventually in 1779, vice the enlightened civil government during the first half of 1776, Congress never had all 13 states represented at any one time, and frequently lacked a quorum of seven to initiate legislation. And thus, both the military and the nation suffered as a result. Also, in the preceding year, 25 to 30 severe winter storms plagued both the North and the Middle States, resulting in starvation, desertion, and yes, mutiny was in the air. This is the fifth year of the war. On the operational level of war in the Southern Theater of Operations, the situation was, to say the least, dismal. The state of Georgia would eventually be brought back into the British Empire. There would be a string of humiliating defeats for the American Corps. Many South Carolina militia leaders would take the British parole, namely Andrew Williamson, Andrew Pickens, and Leo Hammond. The governor, John Rutledge, and the government was in exile in North Carolina. The British would establish interior enclaves throughout the state. The South Carolina Tories and Loyalists would rally to the crown. A civil war erupts in the backcountry. The British Southern strategy is at its zenith. And Major General Gates assumes command of the Southern Department in July of 1780. Now it's not all gloom and doom. There is a glimmer of hope, or in the words of the Patriot Colonel Leroy Hammond, a speck on the horizon would eventually surface, but would begin with a stream of Patriot victories, some of which are depicted here. The Patriot militia would remain the board throughout the South. I'm reminded of a quote by General Sir George Clinton, the British Commander-in-Chief. Kings Mountain was the first link in a chain of events that resulted in the total loss of America. A precursor to that occurred at Musgrove's Mill. And in hindsight, it must be considered to be the foreshadowing of things to come on the road to Yorktown, Virginia. The decisive Patriot victory at the Battle of Musgrove's Mill on the Ennery River in the South Carolina backcountry on August 19, 1780, took place near the plantation and mill of Edward Musgrove, located at the present-day borders of Spartanburg, Lawrence, and Union County in the back or middle country near Clinton, South Carolina. These are the house ruins in front of the visitors center there at the park at Musgrove's Mill. 
Now, Edward Musgrove was originally born in Northern Virginia around 1720, but migrated with his family to the back country of South Carolina, where he would soon be elected captain in the local militia and serve in both the Cherokee War of 1760-61 and the Regulator Movement in 1768. The site of the British encampment looking towards today's visitor center. He would remark that, and I quote, it is wisdom to balance everything in the right scale, end of quote. Edward Musgrove's desire to remain neutral amongst his neighbors in the conflict. But it appears that as early as August 8, 1780, his home and grounds might have been used as a collection point and hospital for the British wounded, all attended to by a Dr. George Ross from their recent engagements in the South Carolina backcountry at Cedar Springs, Wolford Ironworks, and Hanging Rock. By August 10th, however, a muster site was established there, commanded by the local Loyalist militia leader, Colonel Daniel Cleary, with his Dutch Fork South Carolina Royalist Regiment. A photo of Musgrove's mill taken sometime around 1926. Operationally, Musgrove's mill was of significance to the British war effort in the largely Tory-infested region, as whoever controlled it would come to control an important north to south wagon road. Today, more or less, Highway, South Carolina Highway 56, with the Ford providing a usable crossing site over the Ennery River. In the vicinity of Musgrove's Mill. Logistically, the grist mill on the property would funnel flour and meal, ground from the grains harvested along the lower Ennery River, in feeding the local troops, and lastly, its well known location would act as a rallying point for the Crown's forces, operating in what to many of them would be the unfamiliar South Carolina backcountry. Now, some 40 miles separated the British and American patriots between Smith Ford on the north side of the Broad River in North Carolina, but now is the western edge of York County in South Carolina, and Musgrove's Mill on the Yandere River in South Carolina. It was while there that the Patriots were encamped at it that the Patriot Colonel, uh, Colonel Charles McDowell, received intelligence from, and I quote, two active and enterprising, enterprising men of a, and I quote, a vulnerable band of loyalists encamped in the vicinity of Musgrove's Mill, located just 25 to 30 miles north of the British Interior Base of Operations at 96 South Carolina. Given the green light to attempt this by Colonel Charles McDowell, at the onset, this operation was, to say the least, extremely risky. But the Patriot Corps in the South was in dire need of a victory especially after the fall of the important port city of Charleston, South Carolina, and the surrender of the Southern Patriot Army, and the establishment of British enclaves throughout the state. By mid-August 1780, the British stood triumphant in Georgia, and I have to be honest, largely in South Carolina, and were poised to strike into North Carolina. But, Although the Patriot War effort in South Carolina was in dire straits at this time, the cause might be down, but it was certainly not out. Orders were thus issued to Colonels Isaac Shelby, Elisha Clark, and our own James Williams to mount up their combined forces consisting of some 200 to 300 selected Patriot militiamen and depart their Smith's forward camp an hour before sundown on the evening of August 18, 1780, to attack this isolated and believed to be a vulnerable force. Riding some 40 miles cross country through hostile enemy territory throughout the night of 18 and 19 August 1780, the combined Patriot force arrived undetected in the early morning hours of August 19, 1780. Although well-armed, 
many with long rifles, mounted but yet exhausted, both men and horses. They quickly assumed a hasty position a half mile north of the enemy's camp along the southern banks of the Ennery River. Scouts, consisting of a five to six man mounted Patriot patrol, were immediately dispatched to gather additional intelligence. This reconnaissance patrol quickly crossed Cedar Shoals Creek and headed to the vicinity of Heads Ford for what they would call a closer look scene. The Horseshoe Falls area today. Satisfied in having obtained sufficient intel, and while in the process of returning back to the main body, they encountered a five-man loyalist patrol, given the same mission by their superiors. A firefight then ensued with the British suffering one killed, two wounded, but with two returning to their main camp in the area of Musgrove's farmhouse, alerting their comrades to the Patriots' presence. It was also at this time that the Patriots learned from a local sympathizer that the supposed vulnerable British force had just been reinforced the day before, August 18, 1780, by the arrival of some 200 provincial regulars and 100 loyalist recruits under the overall command of a Colonel Alexander Pennant from nearby 96. Thus, total British troop strength now numbered approximately 500, outnumbering the rebel partisans roughly two to one. The Patriot force, in the words of Colonel Shelby, and I quote, too much broken down to retreat, end of quote, and with the element of surprise now compromised, and in addition believed to be outnumbered, they decided it was time to take up a deliberate defensive position, one and a half miles north of the British encampment, astride and perpendicular to the main north-south axis wagon road, today roughly South Carolina 56. This is a photograph looking north along South Carolina Highway 56 from the bridge over the Inori River. Choosing their ground carefully, the Patriots' intent was to deliberately entice the British to attack them uphill across an old, open, and abandoned Indian field, thereby hopefully exposing the British to the deadly accuracy of the long-range rifles and muskets from both the front, uh, front and the flank. Reinforcing the existing terrain, the Patriots decided, using whatever resources they had available, to construct a hasty breastwork of earth, brush, and logs to fill in the gaps between the trees of the timber bridge where they would meet the anticipated British attack. It was at this time that one of Colonel Clark's command, a Captain Shadrach Inman of Georgia, volunteered to lead some 25 mounted men across the Inori River to the vicinity of Musgrove's Mill to lure the unsuspecting British force into the main Patriot kill zone. The Patriot defensive line was formed and it stretched some 300 yards east to west, partly along what is today Avenger Road. Additionally, in case of the need to quickly depart or pursue, the Patriot mounts were positioned some 300 yards behind this improvised line, guarded by a 16-man horse holding and local security detachment. The Patriot forces were deployed with Colonel Isaac Shelby and his North Carolinians holding the right or west flank of the Patriot line. This is from behind the Patriot, Colonel Shelby's line, looking forward to Shelby's actual line. Colonel James William and his South Carolinians would hold the center position astride the wagon road. This is a photograph of Colonel Clark's battle position, or the east flank of the Patriot line, looking from west to east along Avenue Road. 
to prevent the possibility of being enveloped, two small detachments of mounted partisans, consisting of some 16 to 20 men each, were deployed to each flank, with the west right flank placed under Captain Josiah Culbertson, and the east left flank under Captain Shadrach Inman. Both were deliberately positioned to be out of the sight of any attacking force. Lastly, to plug any gaps that might develop in the line, a reserve force of approximately 40 men were held in readiness as a tactical reserve by Colonel Clark. This is a photograph looking towards the tactical reserve position behind Colonel Clark's command. Now in opposition, British forces were led by Colonel Alexander Innes, consisting of a light company of the 3rd Battalion, Royal New Jersey Volunteers, under Captain Peter Campbell, a company reinforced of the Lancey's New York Brigade under a Captain George Kerr, and approximately 100 mounted infantry of the South Carolina Loyalist Regiment, part of Colonel Innes' own command, an attachment of 14 men led by the notorious bushwhacker, Captain David Fanning's South Carolina Loyalist Militia. Overall, this force had been ordered dispatched by General Lord Cornwallis from 96 to reinforce Major Patrick Ferguson and assist him in the training and organization of the local Tory militia and had halted temporarily there with the intent to continue to the journey the next day. However, they would be detained, some of them forever. Already in garrison at Musgrove's Mill was a 100-man detachment of Colonel Daniel Clary's force of local Kingsmen. Ironically, as would happen two months later at the decisive battle of Kings Mountain, of the seven to 800 combatants, only one was a British regiment, namely Alexander Innes. All of the others were Americans. Thus, yet another vivid example of the bitter nature of the Civil War that existed in the back country as a foremost struggle against and between America, or in the German, a Bruder Creek or Brothers War. A contemporary painting of what the artist thought that Musgrove's house looked like. Upon hearing the early morning firefight between the two reconnaissance parties and with the return of two British survivors spreading the alarm, a British council of war was convened by Colonel Ennis at the Edward Musgrove farmhouse. It was at this council, and despite some objections, that they should await the return of a 100-man reconnaissance patrol that had been dispatched previously. Colonel Ennis, however, as the commanding officer, after leaving a 100-man detachment to safeguard their encampment, ordered the rest of the command to follow him in pursuing Captain Hinton's, and I quote, cracker force of rebel ragamuffins. Some people have to learn the hard way. <laughs> Wasting no time in sounding the assembly, British forces led by Colonel Ennis crossed the Ennery River at the fort and deployed into three columns with the provincials commanded by Major Fraser in the center and the Loyalist militia covering both flanks, all provided with the order to hotly pursue the retiring rebels. To cement the trap in front of the British advance, Captain Shadrach Inman fainted several times to harass the advancing British assault force, each time falling back in a convincingly confused manner. This is a photograph that I took from the British perspective of their deployment line about 150 yards in front of Elisha Clark's position. Aped on by the perceived route of the Patriot rabble, once again, the British advancing column fixed bayonets, deployed into line approximately 150 yards in front of the Patriot line, fired a hopefully intimidating volley, gave the shout for King George III, and pressed home the attack. 
Unfortunately for the British, these rebels that they were about to meet were not mere untrained militia, nor poor hunting shirt fellows, but had prior combat experience during the several preceding Cherokee Wars on the frontier. This is a photograph I took from Colonel Clark's line. This is about where the Patriots would open fire. I refer to it as the death tree. The Patriots crouching behind either their hasty breastworks or simply taking the tree for cover took deliberate aim over open sight, withheld their fire until the enemy had advanced to within 70 yards, and upon the signal given by Colonel Shelby, released a death-dealing volley from both the front and flank into the face of the advancing British. Despite suffering terrible initial losses, but motivated by the example of their officers on the field, the British reformed and continued their advance. Having to fire uphill, however, many of their shots went over the heads of the crouching patriots. After making two attempted assaults, the British provincials and Tory militia were momentarily successful, however, in driving members of Colonel Shelby's militia from their defensive line on the Patriot west or right flank. This is a picture taken from the British perspective of Colonel Shelby's position in the distance. Simultaneously, the Patriot East left flank held firm, and fearing the possible unraveling of the entire Patriot right flank, Colonel Clark ordered the commitment of his tactical reserve to bolster the threatened sector. It was at this critical juncture that one of Colonel Shelby's riflemen, by the name of William Smith, shot Colonel Innes from his saddle, creating a degree of confusion and chaos in the British rank. This allowed Colonel Shelby's men to reform, and in conjunction with Colonel Clark's tactical reserve, mounted a spirited close combat counterattack. It was also at this time that another patriot, Widowmaker, as the American marksman were referred to by the name of Robert Bean, severely wounded Major Frazier. Although the initial British retirement south, led by Captain George Kerr, began in an orderly, disciplined manner, within a half mile of the Enemy River, the retreat de degenerated into a rout. With many of the British officers now out of the fight, Command soon broke down, and as reported by Colonel Shelby in his report, although it is written 34 years after the actual battle in 1840, uh, 1814, excuse me, and I quote, the Tories, loyalist militia broke in great confusion. The slaughter from thence to the Enemy River, about half a mile, was very great. Dead men lay thick on the ground, over which our men pursued the enemy. This action was one of the hardest ever fought in the United States with small arms. The smoke was so thick as to hide a man at the distance of 20 yards." End of quote. It was also reported in the Patriot Colonel Samuel Hammond's after action report that the rebels in their bloodlust, and I quote, rushed on with more boldness than prudence, yelling, shooting, and slashing on every hand. It's time for payback. According to local tradition, it was also at this point that the forerun of the rebel yell would be heard, earning them the nickname awarded to them by their opponents as those damned yelling boys. Unfortunately, it was also during this Patriot pursuit that Captain Shadrach Gimmon of Georgia fell mortally wounded to enemy fire. It was also during the end of the British route that the previously dispatched 100-man mounted British patrol returned from making a reconnaissance to the vicinity of Jones Ford, located some 8 to 10 miles downriver to the east. Upon hearing the battle, this force attempted to join the fight across the rocky shoals of the Enemy River near Musgrove's Mill. Although arriving too late to save the day, they were relegated to collecting and evacuating the wounded to a makeshift hospital 
established at the Edward Musgrove's farmhouse. Wanting to exploit their victory, the Patriots hoped to raid the British base at 96 South Carolina, 25 miles away to the southwest. However, a message from Governor Caswell of North Carolina was received by Colonel Charles McDowell, informing them of the American defeat at Camden three days previous and the surrender of General Gates' Continental Army. This message was forwarded to Musgrove's Mill. This resulted in Colonel Charles McDowell and his command having to abandon their camp at Smith Ford in commencing their retirement to the nearby mountains of North Carolina. In that discretion is a better part of valor, it was decided by the victors Musgrove's Mill to bring forward their mounts and evacuate the scene. I think it's quite ironic that both sides in this battle would eventually be forced to retire from the battlefield. With their POWs double mounted with the Patriot militia, but with the precautionary measure of having removed their flints from their muskets, the Patriots soon retired in the northwest direction. Returning to their respective regions, Colonel Clark would retire to Georgia. Colonel Shelby and his men to their over-the-mountain settlements in Tennessee, Virginia, and North Carolina. However, the duty of escorting the British POWs captured at Musgrove's Mill to Hillsborough, North Carolina, fell to Colonel James Williams of South Carolina, where they would be turned over into the custody of the remnant of Colonel Gates' main American army, or what was left of it. So what is the significance of Musgrove's Mill? I think, probably most importantly, that it served as a rallying point, a much needed boost in Patriot morale. Now you'll have to forgive me. No, I'm not going to beg for forgiveness. Born and raised in New Jersey, and proud of it, but an adopted son of South Carolina that I am equally proud of. New Jersey was the other cockpit of the revolution. I believe that what the Patriot victories at the battles of Trenton and Princeton were to rejuvenate the Patriot Corps in the North and the Middle States, the Patriot victory at Musgrove's Mill was to the Southern States. I think it it also validated the Patriots' adoption of their reliance upon the use of irregular, unconventional tactics, and, most important, of what a unified, coordinated effort between state militias could achieve. I also think that it assisted in the eventual recruitment of Patriot forces under Colonels Andrew Pickett, Thomas Sumter, and, yes, Francis Marion. I refer to those three as the three horsemen of the British apocalypse in South Carolina. Huzzah. 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 I think it made the Loyalists and Tories rethink their allegiance to the Crown. It also set the stage for the reunion of Colonel Shelby and Williams as a precursor to the climactic victory at Kings Mountain in October of 1780. I'd like to end with two applicable quotes that I believe captures both the significance and nature of the bit of fighting in the South Carolina backcountry. The first quote comes from a book entitled History of South Carolina and the American Revolution. Many of you are probably familiar with it by the author Edward McCready. And I quote, Huck's defeat, Flag Rock, Rocky Mountain, Hanging Rock, Musgrove's Mill, Nelson's Ferry, Blackstock's, and even King's Mountain were small affairs as great wars go. But they counted up to great preparations in the end. It is not perhaps too much to say that at a most critical moment, they saved the cause of liberty and independence in America. The last quote was made by a British major by the name of George Hangman. He is 
as the British referred the two IC of the second in command of the notorious British Legion. And I quote, the crackers and militia in those parts of America are all mounted on horseback, which makes it totally impossible to force them to an engagement with infantry only. When they choose to fight, they dismount and fasten their horses to fences and rams. But if not very confident in the superiority of their numbers, they remain on horseback, give their fire, and retreat, which renders it useless to attack them without cavalry. For though you repulse them and drive them from the field, you can never improve the advantage or do them material detriment." End of quote. I'd be happy to, I can't say answer maybe, but maybe entertain uh, some questions from the field. Go ahead, sir. Now you might have to speak up. I got tanker, I got tankers here, so. Absolutely, I'll speak up. In terms of a visit, I had the Musgrove's meal, uh, no, this was not the interpretation that no. you 